so much. It's uh, my pleasure to be here. Um, um, in fact, I was trying to put so many things in my first lecture. I was advised that the first lecture should be more general, which means less scientific, I guess. But still, I wanted to cover a lot of territory to tell you how many interesting things one can do if we look at biology through the eyes of material science, in the sense that if we look at organisms look, and considering whether they can teach us lessons in best electronic materials, magnetic materials, high-tech lessons from natural uh, structures. So this is what interests me, less so genetics, less so cellular composition of bi biology, but rather lessons in hardcore material science that we can uh, take from that. And um, the way I wanted to describe that is really starting with my fascination with uh, dreams, maybe. And at this moment, a big part of my research is going into, into thinking about design and architecture, where I believe that so many things that I will try to describe today will come together. And uh, the, the way um, I look at that is if, if we just dream, because it's a dream, and we think about buildings um, in the future, and maybe it's just imaginary building, but it would be really nice if we, we can think about buildings that are multifunctional dynamic materials that have whole range of properties and these properties and I can probably put a very long list and they may adapt to the environment, they may harvest energy and have, they may mechanically reconfigure to spaces to uh, larger and smaller spaces especially important in academic environments where space is so limited. Um, maybe collect and build the water and if we go further and the list collect light, self-heal, we're getting to really difficult parts of material science, maybe change color, not that critical, but maybe nice from aesthetics point of view, certainly something that uh, my design collaborators tell me. Um, self clean and results by following repel ice and moisture. So what if uh, this is something that we want to do? And the way, at least I feel strongly today about, is the way to address that is trying to build as organism, in a sense that there is a lot of things that can be done if we understand and apply principles of self-assembly, principles of bottom-up engineering that nature knows how to do. So really, um, in some ways, to think about cells and organisms, how they build, and can we, from that, use these principles on a completely different scale and uh, think about it from the point of view of studying these biological adaptive systems. Very important to think about their mechanisms. I don't want to build a synthetic organism. I want to use the principles, withdraw these principles from their current context and use very different materials. I'm not supposed to use the same as nature uses but to generate a new set of interesting properties and materials that are not uh, devices and structures that are not possible with our current approaches. So it could be by derived materials, or maybe we don't even have to use these materials. It could be just design principles uh, that can be used there. So just in general, um, this is something that uh, might uh, I would say, first it was the word stealing, but let's call it learning uh, from nature's very rewarding business, and it's just a couple of uh, covers. These artistically, I don't know from the point of view of contribution to science, but really it's very rewarding business. And I will try to show a couple of examples. And since there are so many different things that one can do, and I was thinking how to put together this general lecture, and I thought that uh, I have to a little focus. Um, and then I decided that today we will only talk about plant-inspired materials. 
But even that list is very long, and I'm actually not sure that I will be able to go through all of that because each of every one is a chapter. So maybe we'll talk about lotus sleep, future plan, Venus fly trap, iridescent seeds, vascularity, Venus flower basket, and let's see what we can do with that. Very broadly defined principles that one can uh, extract from biological systems. So, so let's call it chapter one, and let's talk about lotus leaf. And, and there's so much beautiful work in this area. Um, Anish Kuteja here is working in the really on the uh, forefront of that science. And yeah, we love lotus leaf. And it knows how to clean and self-clean its surfaces. And by now, we know almost everything about how it works. And we know that um, it is super hydrophobicity, or in other words, liquids on structured surfaces that are suspended on a cushion of air. And it gives them nearly 180 degrees contact angle, nearly spherical shape, because they're mostly on air, so they can roll off and clean the surface. Very nice, it works in, in, in nature. There's so many different approaches that people use to build these surfaces, many different ways. Um, more stable, less stable. And uh, my interest in this area started with ice, because I'm a crystallographer by training. I'm really interested in anything crystal. And water is kind of easy, but what was ice? And it's something that um, I thought that we can consider is that ice formation begins with droplets, supercooled droplets impacting a supercooled substrate. So it's a dynamic process. So I don't probably have to build an ice phobic material that doesn't form ice, because everything forms ice. But maybe if we think about it as a process where there is impact of droplets on the surface, Maybe due to the fact that superhydrophobic surfaces <coughs> have the ability to, um, to almost friction free surface that the droplets spread, then uh, being expelled from the surface. So, as a crystallographer, um, I was thinking that there is always delay in nucleation, there is induction time for nucleation, and if we can build these surfaces in such a way, that the time it takes for the droplet to withdraw from the surface is less than induction time for nucleation of ice at these conditions, ice wouldn't fall. And indeed, in fact, uh, this is what we've seen. And this is uh, a slow down movie. Hydrophilic surface, this is now minus 25 degrees C on the substrate, minus 5 degrees droplets. Um, on the hydrophilic, they spread and immediately freeze. On hydrophobic, they spread the same way, they contract, but they're still in contact with the substrate, so they will freeze eventually. But on superhydrophobic surfaces, you can build it in such a way that it actually um, being reflected from the surface before crystallization takes place, and in this way, it doesn't matter whether it's a single droplet or even continuous flow, you could see that in these superhydrophobic surfaces, uh, they stay ice-free, in the constant flow of supercooled droplets on supercooled substrate. So very nice, a lot of uh, theoretical studies of this phenomena, just understanding at which moment the, um, the, the force on the droplet that comes together, it's a, a related to friction, and also changes in the thermal transfer in the system, this multi-parameter system that one has to model, and at which moment it begins to fail, at which temperature there would be actually uh, not enough time for the droplet to withdraw from the surface, and we've done it, and we were very happy to see that just theory predicted about minus 20 degrees C, and experimental results showed us minus 25 degrees C. Great. Down to minus 25 degrees, no ice formation on these surfaces. Everything nice, as long as we realize that these are done at very low humidity. And when humidity goes up, and these results, and there are many more papers on this subject from Baranasi's paper, that actually these superhydrophobic surfaces behave worse than a flat surface. 
because it's not about ice anymore. It's about condensation on the surface. It's about nucleation. And now we have even more surface for nucleation. So if it's about frost, which is high humidity process, then you begin to form ice all over the place. So instead of being ice repellent, it becomes much more ice, uh, uh, provides even higher adhesion to a regular surface. And if we go further, really, unless we do something very special, the range of technical challenges with super hydrophobic approach is pretty long. It can be solved one way or another, but in fact, you, we have to realize that they fail at high humidity and even for water effects because of condensation and cross formation. They fail, uh, they have very low pressure stability and temperature stability. For example, if you go to low temperatures, it's ice or frost. If you go to high temperatures, uh, the, uh, the properties of the liquid and energy changes so that it becomes wet. So it certainly fails for low surface tension liquids, unless you do a lot of interesting tricks like, uh, that I'm just doing here. Um, many of them are, are fragile. There are ways to improve their mechanical stability. But again, they're prone to damage if they're damaged. Now, uh, then uh, there is not that many self-healing uh, strategies. They're easily contaminated. And maybe it's uh, the list that describes my problem uh, that built up this time with trying to solve all of them at the same time. But, but again, let's really look at this uh, through the prism of if we're doing biomimetic science, or I would rather call it bioinspired science, I think the main problem is not to mimic a certain biological principle, but rather to look for, for the organism that gives you a better principle. So being stuck with the idea of uh, super hydrophobic surface is a beautiful lot of leaf effect, and it's not on the water, of course, it's on the butterfly wings, and there are so many um, places in nature where this principle is used, but it's not the only one. So what if we look further, and if we really uh, put in a range of very bad problems, and in particular, it's probably too late to talk about that, but if I would give you a lecture a month ago, you would understand how critical all that, um, coming from Boston, where ice and, and snow was so significant. But if it's not only ice, if we talk about windows, dirty windows, solar panels, graffiti, marine fouling, let's put more oil transfer, or infestation, or you go into medical places, if we talk about um, catheters and blood, and it's getting brighter. Um, but all these problems are very different, different mechanisms. But in fact, it's there is a principle that we, physical scientists, have a tendency to try to simplify the systems, to reduce them to range of manageable parameters. So if I were to look at that, they're all different, but there is one common theme, that there is accumulation of unwanted material on the surface, and we want to get rid of it, or actually not to accumulate it at all. So of course it's different between ice and bacteria and blood, um, but is there a way, nature give it, it can give us a clue, which is different, let's say, from water sea. So if we look at oil as a problematic system, and there's another plant, and I said it is a plant-inspired lecture. So here is the carnivorous plant. In the dry day, all these ants are running around. On a wet day, the same ants just notice they cannot stay on the surface. They slide inside <laughs> the digestive juices to the stomach of this plant. It's a different strategy. It's not a lot of leaf strategy. But what is it there? Again, it's a plant. It's a carnivorous plant. It needs to eat. Um, if you look at, at these uh, ants and the way they attach to the surfaces, there are two mechanisms. One is um, what I would call primitive because it's just simply mechanical cooking on this surface. But there's also chemical, which is inside this pouch, uh, there is oil. And depending on how much oil is released, it provides a certain level of adhesion to the surface. 
So it's this oil that determines the adhesion and how they run around on a driver. So what is about the surface of this uh, plant? It's also structures. In fact, in many ways, the structure itself is similar to structures of many superhydrophobic uh, systems in, at least in, in, in biology. However, the difference and the main difference is that this structure is highly thick. So what happens when it is a wet day during rain or just high humidity is that being structured and hydrophilic, it becomes super hydrophilic. It means that it picks up the layer of water and creates an effective contact angle of zero. So there is a layer of a liquid, in this case water, and at the interface between oily feet, these oily feet never see the underlying substrate in a wet day. So you create a liquid-liquid interface, and of course these are slippery. So in this way, what we decided to do is just really truly take this principle. And we call it flips, uh, slippery that we can use for our surfaces, and in, in many ways I will try to show tomorrow, because today I'm not going to go into details of that, that uh, all the problems, um, including pressure stability, energy saving, repairable uh, quality, power resistance, um, ease of manufacturing can be solved with that approach. And it's in so many ways counterintuitive approach, because you do need roughness, but you need roughness to create ultra smooth surfaces. Because roughness is there, provides a porosity and capillarity that gives the way of holding liquid in place, and in this way to provide a screen, a, a protection layer uh, to cover the underlying soil. So today I will just show a couple of movies where this is really different from other approaches, and in particular the ability to form uh, substrates that are, have the ability to self-heal. So here is super hydrophobic surface. This is crude oil. It's not even moving. Here is a slippery surface, and it was cut in pieces, and immediately the droplet starts to move around. I love oil, not only because it's challenging, but also because it's black and it's very easy to see if there are defects. But it's beyond the ability of self-healing. This is amazing ability, and it's due to the ability of liquid to reconfigure on the surface. When you cut it, you create even more roughness, and liquid likes this surface, so it will redistribute again and recreate a slippery surface. But now, since it's designed of three components, the roughness, the liquid that you use as a slippery liquid, but also how to uh, match the chemistry between themselves, one can think about uh, high temperatures or low temperature conditions and design a system that works anyway. So even for water, if you go to high temperatures, the surface tension goes down and reaching the level of, of organic liquids. But here is the example of superhydrophobic surface and slippery surface, 200 degrees C, you can see that oil is actually boiling, uh, but it provides a nice way to slide on the surface with no contamination. You want to do it at low temperature, here is an example of half of the aluminum plates, regular aluminum plates, and this actually had a aluminum plate, and this is slippery plate, and you could see highly humid environment, and at the same, this is minus five, five degrees C, no ice formation on this side, and force formation on the other side. There's many other things that one can do. One can play with, with lubricant viscosity, and for the same conditions, to have surfaces that would have different velocity of droplets on the surface just simply by playing this is possible. So there's many knobs that you can use here in the system, and in addition to that, to have the range of, um, this is again crude oil, and again comparison between slips, super hydrophobic surface, and highly smooth aluminum, and to see how different is behavior just within the same surface. Here is yet another challenging system, algae. Half of the glass is coated, the other half is not, and you would see algae on one surface and nothing on the other side. And examples are numerous, and I'm just showing it here today for those who are not going to be here tomorrow to explain the mechanism and what is happening in this system. There is a part of the 
I was highly criticized for that. But you could see that, uh, that you can use graffiti and everything that slides from that surface. And there are many other things that I can show. Um, I would just finish this part now by saying that if you go back to original application, at least what, what the organism does with that, and we were studying how insects behave on the surfaces, we were supposed to this poor ant really wanted to have jam, but neither ant nor jam can stay put on the surface. And neither can bacteria, but it's a topic for detailed discussion, and I will present it tomorrow, what happens in, in biological media, what happens in different conditions. And that brings me to yet another plant, to yet another system, which we study a lot, or at least there's a lot of interesting things that that fascinates me and maybe a third of my book is now looking at dynamic materials. And let me just as an inspiration put multiple things on, on, on this board. Again, somewhat unrelated, but the top one are related to plants, and I said that a plant uh, inspired, so here is fly trap, yet another carnivorous plant. Um, but also wheat ones, the way they see themselves in the ground is when the humidity changes, they change the angle between these higher pressure uh, ones, and depending on this uh, angle, the seed is capable of seeding itself into the ground. There's flowers that open and close, we all know that. But I can put more, as I said with flowers, but it's definitely more than that. Sea urchins, I work a lot with sea urchins. Between the spines of sea urchins, there is what is called the area. And they're opening and closing in constant motion within sea urchins. And this is what keeps sea urchins clean. So it's a dynamic way of creating flow at the interface that keeps uh, dust uh, that keeps uh, sand particles and bacteria away from the surface. I can throw here cilia and flagella, and again, nothing in common, but one common feature for a material scientist would be that all of these things have uh, functions related to the high aspect ratio structures that are moving, and this movement provides reconfiguration of the structures, and this reconfiguration changes properties. So what can we do if we just extract this simple principle? So just carry surfaces wouldn't do, they're static. So they have to move. So what nature does to move things is using a muscle. So what would be the simplest way as a chemist to think about muscle, but also as a material scientist to think about spiny surfaces? So let's say we can, of course, use lithography and create high aspect ratio spiny surfaces. This is, for example, silica. That's fine, but nothing special is happening. Those, and they may have superphobic properties and, and optical properties, of course, but I want to make them dynamic. So what if now I think about the muscle, and I take the muscle in particular gels, and different kinds of gels, uh, that have a property to change the volume in response to environment. So let's now combine them together. So structures alone can do something. The gel alone can do something. But if I now combine them in the simplest possible way, and we call it um, styling with the gel, um, is the high aspect ratio structures and the hydrogel that is being synthesized within this structure hairy surface. So what happens then is that this gel will create a uh, structure that will either expand or contract, and as it does that, this, the high aspect ratio features would either bend or tilt, depending on the type of connection, and upon response to either humidity or other stimuli would put in motion your materials. So here is a simple take on dynamic materials that really was, um, in, in so many ways, um, affected by thinking about how plants open and close, and, and what is the simplest muscle we can imagine. But here's an example of um, these 
high expectation structures put in motion. In dry state, when the jaw is contracted, they're lying down. Same region in a wet state, they're standing up. Here is the movie, and it's a very fast actuation. Here is it standing up, lying down, standing up, lying down. We, you can look at that and make it more interesting by applying a, a structure. You can pattern your muscle. And it's, of course, you can do modeling, but it's even uh, intuitively clear that where you have a thicker muscle, you have more, a higher force to move your structures around. And in this way, you can build a pattern surface that then, in response to uh, the stimulus, instead of random bending and tilting, would have very specific domains and very specific structures as a function of, in this case, using a confined surface that has a honeycomb structure. And here's the outcome of that, and it's a beautiful color-changing material that upon self-assembly of these um, micron-sized features, and since the feature size is chosen to be in a visible light um, uh, wavelength, uh, that as it assembles in response to external stimuli, um, in this case, in response to humidity, it actually changes color and it creates interesting patterns. It actually, there's a whole range of structures that uh, act as we disagree. They open and close and it can capture particles. You can do other things with these systems. And here's, again, just examples of the same surfaces where gel is now holding a marker. And depending on the stretching of the marker, that in, in chemical words will define uh, concentration of your marker inside your gel, depending on the stretching, the words or concentrated marker will appear or disappear in response to, in this case, it's in response to pH. One can design these surfaces, and we're doing it now together with the School of Design, where these structures are metallized. They're all on the micron size level, so you don't see them. But when the gel is responsive to temperature, when the temperature is low, they're standing up because the gel is expanding. When the temperature is high, the gel is contracting, the structures lie down, you don't have to use energy, it responds to the environment outside and becomes reflective as the dynamic window. There's yet another system that um, we uh, decided to make it in a homeostatic material that keeps a steady state. It holds the temperature steady in the system because it is designed in such a way that it produces heat up to the level that the gel contracts. It contracts, nothing can be done when they are far away from the chemical reaction. It cools to a certain temperature, it has to stand up again, and it oscillates in this way, keeping the temperature in the narrow range defined by the gel that you use. So there's a range of things you can do by playing with other things, not only moisture, but playing with uh, the fields that are temperature responsive, pH responsive, light responsive, mechanical signal responsive gels, which can be now combined together with the skeletal, with bones of the structure, but also can have different symmetries. So you can induce different types of movement, different types of reconfiguration, and uh, different types of motion in these structures. So one can do now, if we talk about uh, hydrophobic and hydrophilic. Now let's try to combine it with what I was talking before. And what if now I take the gel that is hydrophilic and the structures that are hydrophobic. On a dry day, the structures are down because dry, uh, gel is contracted and the droplets on the surface of the surface will be exposed mostly to hydrophilic substrate. So it becomes on a dry day, it it extracts more moisture. It's hydrophilic on a dry day. However, on a rainy day, when the gel expands, only hydrophobic part of the surface is exposed. And again, it's in response to environment. So it's a reversible surface that 
either works as superficial phobia and repels moisture, repels droplets in the wet state, or becomes uh, hydrophilic and it's reversible on the, in, on the dry day. Or, let's go even further, and I was talking about slippery surfaces that instead of air would have a certain liquid inside your structured surface, but you can do a lot of interesting tricks if you think about it in dynamic fashion. So since the liquid inside your surface is related to the available volume inside the structured material, I can use um, reconfigurable materials, could be porous or structured, uh, where the materials is lying down or standing up, and in this way, the, the top liquid is either withdrawn back to the structured material and becomes sticky, or, depending on strain in this case, it will come back and the droplets can either you stop, and you can see that you stretch it, or when it stops, you release it, it continues to go without staining the surface. So one can think about dynamic materials that change their properties, and with that, and uh, talking about materials, dynamic, interesting materials, let's talk about yet another system, and in particular iridescent seeds, maybe butterflies a little bit. Um, but the idea is now, let's talk about liquids instead of on, liquids in structured surfaces. There is a little bit in slippery surfaces, but much more in what I want to present now. This is a beautiful work about this um, uh, iridescent seed, and uh, it has beautiful color, and it's structural color. It has no pigment, it's purely structural color. Or if we go to butterfly that is, running, that is around the plant all the time, this green region is the structural color that is inverse colloidal crystal. So at a certain moment we decided to try to do it, and being lazy, um, instead of traditional approach to colloidal assembly to make inverse uh, structures, what is generally done is you use solvents, your colloids are assembly, then solvents evaporate, then you infiltrate it with sol gel solution, then you burn away your colloidal particles and you end up with inverse structure. So we were lazy, we didn't want to do it in, in so many steps, so we're assembling our colloids not from a solvent that goes away, but in fact directly from sol gel solution. So what happens then is not only that it's faster, but it also provides a way to, uh, to avoid cracking and the problems in colloidal fil films because sol gel, if it's um, if gelation takes the same time as colloidal assembly, will provide a gluing to your system to make films at a huge length scale, whatever size you want, that would have pretty much no cracks in them on a very large scale. That's nice, and obviously it's much better than direct colloidal crystal, it's better than colloidal crystal that then was infiltrated and converted into inverse structure, because there's a lot of overlay formation, cracking due to um, infiltration and the stress related to that. These are nice, not only just because they're beautiful and nice and nice colors, and it's of course the project that uh, High school student, in fact, did. And obvious that he was in my group last summer mm -hmm. because most of the time they were following soccer and that was what they'd done. But in principle, how one can make these now colloidal kind of crystals um, with different colors, maybe it's nice, maybe it's beautiful. But beyond that, I want to um, come back to superhydrophobicity in, in a strange way. So yes, we now can make defect-free colloidal crystals, inverse colloidal structures. So let's go back to superhydrophobicity, and butterfly probably is the best example to show you. So here is superhydrophobic wing of the butterfly. Water droplets run away. If I put alcohol on these surfaces, they don't run away because it's now uh, infiltrating the surface. But now since it's structural color, as it inf infiltrates the surface, the refractive index contrast between uh, the structure and the liquid that is inside goes down, 
and therefore the color is gone. So the only color you see is actually the underlying color of the pigment below the wing. But it's reversible. The moment alcohol evaporates, it goes back to its original color. So what if I want to play with the combination of these properties? And what if I actually want to combine it with yet another uh, system that I studied a long time ago, which is uh, brittle stars that change color during the day and during the night. And the way they change color is not due to um, by a mimic, as it's generally described, it's purely optics effect, where through the um, porous system in the skeleton during the day, the pigment covers the surface, and during the night it's withdrawn back. Why? To optimize the intensity of light reaching the receptor. So there is some interesting microfluidic system here that if this microfluidic system would be combined in a new organism, let's say, with the idea of butterflies, and being a chemist would be nice to think about inverse colloidal uh, structures that have interconnected porosity as a beautiful color if you choose porosity in a certain wavelength. But if I now infiltrate it, then the color is gone because the refractive index contrast is too small. But I can play now with chemistry. I can have certain regions of one chemistry, other regions with other chemistries, and in this way, I create surfaces where different regions can or cannot be infiltrated by liquids. So now I can use many different chemistries that are more or less sensitive to different regions. So here's a nice combination of optics with chemistry because of all kinds of <coughs> marine life, I love marine life. Um, and if we do that, and we use a variety of possibilities, there's a lot. But also remembering that it's not only chemistry, but the fact that I have almost perfect colloidal structure, <coughs> that the liquid for the infiltration is not enough to wet the surface. It actually has to have a certain angle, because to go from one pore to another pore has to overcome that barrier. And then you can tell you all about it and how much energy it costs. So a combination of geometry and surface chemistry gives you the ability to create a highly sensitive uh, surface that would give you up to 1% difference in, let's say, in uh, concentration of one liquid in another liquid to be able to resolve it from the point of view of what it can or cannot wet. Here is an example of having a strip, uh, that image here is a nice green strip, and depending which liquid I add to the same strip, different words will come out based on um, wettability and the energy barrier that it costs to go from one pore to another, especially when all the necks in your pore structure are exactly the same size. So one can do a lot of interesting things. Uh, we, we actually use it in, in our own cleaning room uh, as a almost pH paper to say whether it's methanol, ethanol, or isopropanol, which just gives you these letters. But this sensitivity could be so strong is that um, we can tell even different uh, lengths of uh, alkanes. And just simply by counting, let's say, number of T's that they, wish, uh, they will show. You can do more interesting things. Your chemistry might not be just simply wetting uh, induce neutral chemistries. You can use chemistry as an indicator for temperature. For example, your chemistry may be sensitive to UV, your chemistry may be sensitive to temperature, and based on the changes on wettability, you can say, in this particular case, it's photoresponsive way, whether your surface was exposed to light and actually to what um, dose of light it was exposed, because it will wet the surface in different ways depending on the exposure. So you can have a history of that and, of course, play with all kinds of cute things. And there's some examples of um, you know, my students playing with that. There's a good sign, you touch it with one solvent, it shows 
Was it Polish or something? You touch it with another one, it says do it. And the other one is done. You can do it with even colors if you play with different color and sizes. Um, and you, it's not necessarily to do it with liquids, it could be vapor, where the things, the words appearing and disappearing the moment the liquid is gone. So there's H sign appearing, there was absolutely no sign of H before. And it's extremely high level that, uh, that can be done, and it's fully reversible. And again, in collaboration with um, the School of Design, we are looking on potentially using them as bathroom tiles that have iridescent color, but you take a shower, it shows a nice pattern. Uh, there is something that they plan to have. This is School of Design at Harvard, and it's ugly when it's raining. Look at this. And what they want to do is that, in fact, it has material that shows nice pattern appearing when the rain is outside. So again, you are wetting the surface, but you're wetting it in a very interesting uh, manner. But of course, if you take my group, they're mostly interested in creating these glasses that show different messages when you drink the right type of alcohol. <laughs> so, uh, so this one, for example, shows thank you with water, nothing with alcohol, and it comes back to your iridescent color. This is a beautiful chess set that you only know which piece that is when you pour exactly the right concentration or with the right liquid in it. So it's kind of difficult to play chess this way, but it's fun. So with that, let me just probably skip vascular system, although it's interesting, but I will skip that. I may even skip this, but I still want to mention there's nothing about flowers here except for the name of the sponge. So it's sponge, it's delicious sponge, it's fully made of glass, well, with it, less than 1% of organic matter. So it's a glass sponge living deep in the ocean. It's called Venus's flower basket. That's why I put it here. It's a nice example of a structural, natural glass that forms a building with extremely interesting uh, properties that is optimized for strength, fiber optics, and fluidics. It has fiber optical fibers with excellent fiber optical properties around this point right here. And it has a mechanical structure that um, is highly reinforced. Um, very difficult to break this glass because it has many different levels of hierarchy. So if it's, now I'm going down to the structure of this glass chessboard structure, every second is reinforced. Each of these beams are in fact a combination of multiple beams. Now each of these beams is is um, fiber reinforced beam and each of those fibers are laminated fibers. So it's extremely strong glass and we are uh, studying its mechanical properties. We just had last week the PNAS paper understanding some optimization of the chemical properties here. And what I want to finish with, maybe to go back to that idea of a dream house, and whether we can just take lessons from these completely unrelated organisms and to build something <coughs> interesting. And I just showed you some subset of things that one can conceivably do and hopefully scale up and use it as real materials, not just as a proof of principle. But beyond applications, and I understand this is School of Engineering, but I'm a chemist by training. I like fundamental science. I like understanding, if I'm lucky to understand fundamental principles. I want to finish with just a couple of slides on uh, flowers, plants, but these are nanoflowers. Each of those is about 10 to 50 micron in size. And what I want to say here is that there's a lot of potential in thinking about dynamic processes and in particular playing with these feedback systems. 
And the example that I will show, and these flowers that I will show, and that's why I'm calling it gardening at the nanoscale, is the idea that if you think about feedback systems, the nation knows how to do it. We're not that great at that. It's not easy to find the right combination of materials, and I'm here playing with chalk and glass. As simple as that. No organic matter involved. Inspired, inspired, but without cells or biology in any way or form, and even without polymers in this system. But one can think about a system where when chalk is falling, it creates conditions for glass to form. Now glass begins to form and changes microenvironment in such a way that it blocks the formation of chalk. At a certain moment, pH changes again, and the system circulates between these two phases, and we create an interesting feedback system. Here's where pH, where glass can form. And there's so many interesting things that, uh, that are done here in, um, by Rick in, in the silica deposition. But if now I have silica deposition, and I'm lo looking at carbonate deposition, and I'm playing with this diagram, I can create a feedback system that will allow me to create any shape I want, not by chance, but by rational planning of the environment. And just to finish with that, I will show you some examples of how to grow complex structures of any kind, you know, how they appear and why, and what is mathematical and chemical reasons for having Structures of that kind, of this kind, that kind, of that. Each of them has a very spe special part in the phase diagram. And here are structures that we can grow. So that's about 50 micron in size. And yes, it's of course colored um, electron <coughs> microscopy picture, but it doesn't have to be colored. Uh, uh, artificial color that I'll show you in a second, that in fact this is first. What grows first is the green part, you see nothing on it, and then the red part will grow, and there's a way how you change the conditions in this particular case, just by changing a little bit pH in the system, it starts to grow flowers, and only at the tips of these not nowhere else it's allowed to form. And yes, indeed, it's green and red, because I can use uh, rhodomy and D, and that's a problem. It's myself, but OK. And you could see that there's a green part and the red flowers growing on top of each other. And there's a range of things that we can create, all of them grow, and you can sculpt them dynamically as they grow. At this moment, tell me which structure you want. You try this flowers just as a beginning. But in fact, I can escape these tools growing on top of these green parts. The flower growing on their tips. And here's just to show that uh, I'm not looking for them in certain parts. They're all right now. There's yet another type of structure. Yet another type of structure, and more of these that we can open first grow the bars and then uh, stalks and then flowers on top of them. And with many levels of complexity, and whether flat leaflets or rose like structures. And I'm not going to go through mechanism, but what I want to finish with is that as a chemist, that loves material science, probably the most reasonable definition of what I do is material science. But I do believe that it's fundamental science that gives us the ability to understand and ultimately create functional materials that can function by design, not by chance. So with that, I want to finish my talk with the group. I do believe that material science can uh, really 
because taking bi-inspired concepts can help us a lot, just a matter of choosing a good biological system. And there are many that we don't know about, and they're much more rele relevant to problems that we want to solve. Just we need to think about them, look, look for them, collaborate with biologists um, that can give us ideas, and it's a lot of fun in addition to potential um, outcomes in, in engineering. And I want to finish with thanking my students, yes, my collaborators, my students, my postdocs involved in different aspects of the project that I uh, mentioned today. And I want to thank you for your attention. Plastics, some of their advantages are the very manufacturable, the very light. The main disadvantage we're addressing here is the fact that they don't transfer heat very well. And that can be a problem for applications, say, where they're used. To